Space. The final frontier. Well, okay, not, not really. All right, uh, take two, take two. Here in the Mitten State, welcome to Code 47, bringing you all things Star Trek, spanning the quadrants, the best thing since the neutral zone. Back again in the Thunderdome. Wait, wrong show. Okay, we're not in the Thunderdome. Uh, but this is the Code 47 podcast on the Secret Friends Unite podcasting network. I am uh, your humble servant, Charlie Carden, Trek Lord of West Michigan. Here, as always, uh, with my esteemed colleagues, Peter. Hello. Hey, everybody. And the the extra special commentator couldn't get rid of her if we tried. That would be Katie Quinn. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes, yes. All right. Big week. Uh, big couple weeks for Star Trek. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. It's so action-packed. There were a couple of fuzzy news stories. I thought, oh, we could talk about that. But you know what? No. We're going right. We're going for the jugular, which is exactly what happened in Episode 9. Talk about some... Ugh. All right. Who wants to do the honors on Episode 9? Whoever talks first. Oh, I'll geez. do it. You're so, killing me. Go for it, Peter. Episode 9. All those who wander. The Enterprise crew comes face to face with their demons and scary monsters when their landing party is stranded on a barren planet while rescuing a ship, I might add. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> just, just, not, just, just not for kicks. Just for kicks, yeah. right. Oh, Peter. I know with both of these episodes that you were you were on the you were on the downturn. You had some criticisms. You're already speaking. Go for it. What what how, what were you feeling about episode nine? Um, yeah. So I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I didn't really like this episode. Um, one, as you can see by my uniform, my mo my boy Hammer. Mm, it was it was it was a, it was a red shirt shooting gallery. It just mm -hmm. I was not happy with that. <laughs> Hammer was my favorite character, and he died. Now, um, I, I will tell you that I've subsequently read that he'll be back. Don't the actor really will be back. Hammer might be back in flashbacks, be. maybe. Oh, but the okay. character's gone. I did read, because I saw something about him on an interview. I was like, oh, they bring back Hammer? They're bringing my boy? Nope. Now, my question would be, do you, are you... Or did you not like it because you liked the character? Or did you not like it because you felt like it didn't fit within Hammer's narrative? A bit of both. Okay. Um, so one, I just like the character. I like that he is a grumpy ass Enar. And, oh, you know, nah. he's totally hilarious. agree. Sure. Also, the actor is 90% blind. Right. So, I, so it's just an amazing casting choice. Right, you know, it was just a really choice. interesting casting yeah. idea. Yeah. Right, but like, right. I think that I think for me, like part of it was like when they did the recap and it was like, I'm here to fix what's broken. And then ultimately I'm sitting there going like, so was Uhura broken? And that's what you were fixing? Because that seems to be all you did. And right. I didn't really like that that's all he was there for ultimately. Um, Wait, I think no. that there should have been more. When you say therefore, you mean in this episode or just in that the context of that relationship between the two characters? The context of the show. Like he like what did okay. he ultimately fix? Aside from, you know, being an engineer and fixing a few things like doing engineer right. stuff. Like what did he ultimately change? What did he fix in the grand scheme of things? If right. you go by what they did in the show, he fixed Uhura's desire for Starfleet. Mm -hmm. Which I suppose well, is a big deal, but it didn't feel like it had enough oomph for him if that makes sense do you think would you liken it to you know comparatively end of the first season you know we lost tashiar at approximately the same period it was a few episodes before the end of that yeah. season but what did that character really bring to the table you know do you well, feel that... didn't bring much of anything right exactly which is kind of what which is in a lot of ways, uh, you know, maybe in the first season of any show, your ancillary characters really can't because they don't have much of a backstory right. or whatever it is. But um, OK, uh, Katie, you know, I would say I knew Hammer was I, as, I loved Hammer. He was an amazing character. I knew he was not going to make it through this season as soon as he was introduced. Well, he was, he was, he was you know? introduced um, the first time he's you're really seeing him is when he's talking to Ahura and she is already showing those inklings of, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be here. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And he's yeah. shown as kind of the foil to that. 
So mm-hmm. I knew her entire arc was going to be him showing her like, yes, you do belong. You are here. And that like, it's especially as soon as they had that episode with the serene squall where she was and him were trapped. Oh, yeah. in the, the cargo bay deal. Yeah, yeah. In the cargo bay. I was like, Oh yeah, no, he's like, I'm surprised he made it through that episode. I thought he was going to die then. So did um, I. Actually. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I honestly didn't give it any thoughts. So you guys are as usual light years ahead of me. <laughs> um, but uh, so you think it was, and yeah, I'm here to fix what's broken. That was kind of mm-hmm. your buddy. You're kind of your yeah. buddy. Cop I mean, moment. I saw really him. Felt. He was, yeah, he was there and he was written into the story as a narrative arc to help Ahura find her place. Gotcha. And so I think once yeah. he did that, then he was, okay, there is no reason for him, you know, reason for him to be there because she has now finished that narrative arc as much as I hated to see him leave because I think they did a great job on building him up unlike they did with mm-hmm. Tasha where she was just kind of there to exist and there wasn't right. really much to her part of the reason yeah. why there was so much you know kind of sadness and anger in results of him dying like he did is because he was a beloved character and they did a really great job writing him even though he yeah. was only there to really be a plot point for Ahura right he was a stepping stone kind mm-hmm. of along along the way of one of the more established characters, but right. as we've got, even in the 10 episodes of this show, we've gotten more fleshing out of her character. We got her entire origin story. We're in TOS. We never got her first name. That mm-hmm. was, that was not even canonical at all until the show, because it was introduced in JJ's movies, which are not canonical to the prime universe. Yeah. If, unless I'm very much mistaken, somebody jump in and tell me if the, if her first oh, name I'm not going to know it's canon. That's yeah. Gonna be I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if her first it name is Miota ever really got thrown ca- out. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't really canon until it came up in the JJ movies. Now, because of how the JJ movies worked, it was retroactively canon because that part of her timeline didn't shift. But <laughs> oh my god, those damn movies! Oh, like I said, the three of us a little further on down the road, we're gonna get our chance to talk about those films. And okay, anyway, um, <laughs> all right, let's touch on real briefly the action pieces of it. Were were the allegories to the aliens movie? Did that bother you? Did that not bother you? Because it was in a lot of ways kind of paint by numbers with. You know, the dirty little girl and the, the the aliens popping out of the chest and the the dark and the this and the that. And it didn't bother me a lick. I loved it. Gorn is scary as shit. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Peter says, yeah. Uh, Peter, you can you can take Please. this. I'm late. It's OK. <laughs> hey, I didn't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> um. As much as I really like it when Star Trek pulls from bigger things or other things, and you're like, "Heh, I recognize that," and yeah, like they make I got the story that reference. and they, make, and they right. make it fun. Like, there's a couple. I don't remember. There's a few episodes where it's like, "Hey, that's this story." Even um, episode six in this show is actually pulled from a book. Um, oh, like, really? Almost like entirely, it's pulled from a book. Um, so, like, I don't mind when they do that, but it there were just things from aliens that just got thrown in there that I'm like, why, why are you doing that? You it know? made you all, it made you all philosopher. Why? Yeah. So <laughs> like, like, especially the kid, like she did, aside from like the, the moment where she just like shock value of, Oh no. It's like, it's a kid. Here? It's a kid. It's a kid in like, danger. Wasn't that relationship with like Ripley or anything in the original that like made her purpose there good. Right. Um, well, I thought her purpose there was to help La'an because that was kind of a reclaiming of La'an's story of not being able to save her brother and having to right. go through the Gorn and knowing what was going to happen and s- kind of helping humanize La'an's you know, trauma of being that age I and having that. to survive all of that mm-hmm. stuff, which is why she ultimately leaves at the end of that episode because she's like, I need to see this through. And she has family and I can't just let her i can't have her just struggling through life and just being let loose like glan was she's like yeah. I, I need to be able to see her through okay. and and that and and sense. and sending her off you know and, and again a lot of the, the theme of these last couple of episodes um were the the crews kind of going their own separate ways um mm-hmm. which is you know it's a natural storytelling driver that happens in a lot of season finales particularly in star trek you know we see the end of 
season six of DS9, Jadzia Dex dies. Cisco goes back home on a, you know, an emotional journey. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. it's, and then, and then to see how it all comes back together. I mean, it happens in shows everywhere. It happens in sitcoms, you know, it's uh, so-and-so yeah. left a letter that he quit. And then the summer goes by and, oh, is Ron Swanson coming back to his job in Parks? <laughs> it's, just, it's just whatever, you know what I mean? So right. it's, it's, you know, and, and uh, again, you know, Uhura is back at the academy. We don't know if she's back at the academy because she has a couple. We don't. We don't know how far along she was. So, or I don't know if looking at that cadet badge, it says what rank a cadet. I would think be. she was a fourth year based okay. on the uh, based on the things. Right. So, so she could she could turn around and be back mid season. You know, right. because she she graduated and they're like, we got to have you back. Um, but anyway. Um, all right, let's move it. Let's move on for sake of, and certainly we can touch back on this episode once we get to our big wrap up. So the yeah. season finale, Katie, it's all yours. All right. Um, in the season one finale, just as Captain Pike thinks he has figured out how to escape his fate, he is visited by his future self, who shows him the consequences of his actions. Ah, the ghost of future monster maroons. <laughs> 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 now, Peter, Peter and I are uniform nitpickers. Uh, the Monster Maroon is what a lot of Star Trek cosplayers consider to be the brass ring, the hard to get. I mean, there's a uniform with so many bits and bobs and different stuff that getting it right is a near impossibility. Getting it wrong is really easy and ugly because I've seen plenty of those photographed and whatever it is. Um, and I know I'm really focusing on the minutia here. But but yeah, no, Pike is seeing himself 20 years in the future, I would, I would just guesstimate just by knowing when that uniform came around. And they did take the Monster Maroon. And for the uninitiated, the Monster Maroon is the TOS film era uniform. The red jacket with the strap across and stuff. And it's just very slick. And any, most most truckers that I talk to are just... I, that sounded like truckers. Most truckers, <laughs> most truckers are not talking about truck. Most... Star Trek fans that I talk to who are customers are, are wild about that one. So anyway, I'm focusing on Minutia. Um, Peter, I did read your big long post about this one, and I want I want and again I, I know we're zero for two for you this one, but but I want to give you equal time. So feel free, please. To be fair, I did watch this episode again, and I don't like hate it. Okay. Okay. Good. So <laughs> so we graduated from like a. 4.8 to like a 6.1 like yeah, out of sure. 10. Okay, there yeah. we go. I like I like those numbers. Those are good yeah. numbers. Um yeah. At least with the uniform, I really didn't like how it got redone. The um, only thing I think that's super weird about it I didn't Katie, like this. Yeah. I didn't like this was kind of the big thing when yeah. they added the microprint on the shoulders. It right. looked really wonky because of I've seen that uniform so many times. Yeah, the uh, um, my my big rub was for no reason the the and, and again Katie, I'm sure you're like oh god, listen to these nerds talk about uniform. No, you're shirt. good. You're good. Um the uniform flap is supposed to be I, it's straight across. I'm, well, I'm looking yeah. at, uh, I had an artist named J.J. Wind out of Indonesia who did a, uh, a beautiful illustration of April and myself. I'm looking right at it because it's in the foyer of my house and I'm sitting at my dining room table. The jacket comes straight across and the clasp sits really at the collarbone. And it's nice and short. And it's nice and short. Now it goes all the way down and the strap is like maybe, it's maybe a third longer than it was. In the, and I just don't understand why. But I digress. Let's Can talk. I offer let's, a counterpoint? Please, I absolutely. know the counterpoint. I'm just saying I didn't like it. <laughs> no, no, oh, wait, wait, no. Wait. it is an alternate timeline. And they've been at war now for, you know, several, you know, maybe 20 years. We always, years. we and, and a counterpoint to your counterpoint. Look at the Trek episode yesterday's Enterprise where Tashiar is alive in this alternate timeline because there's been a war with the Klingons. Mm-hmm. Also different uniforms. TOS, but the instead of having the V neck collar, it's a rounded collar. So wartime equal fashion changes. Just found well, it, just found it, just found was, a name for the episode. Yes, I will. You know, argue as someone who has an art degree and has studied some art history, war definitely in conflict definitely changes how art is perceived and developed. So I could easily see how like that strapping would ch- you know might stay there because they're going for a more utilitarian look. They're going for okay. a more structured look. Because, okay. you know, and also they just don't have the creative time and energy to really put into refashioning all of these new uniforms. Right. Just slap it together and, and something's, something's going to end up being different. So a different guy, if it was supposed to be Joe Smith, who was the designer and he got, 
you know, killed because the ship he was on got blown up. Then his brother Jack Smith is the designer and he likes longer flaps. <laughs> but anyway, <Exactly>. let, <laughs> let, let's talk about the episode. So this episode was, it, it was, you know, it was your ghost, or it was your Scrooge, it was your, you know, uh, the, pulling on the tapestry, it was the road not taken. Uh, Pike jumps out there and he says, uh, you know, in, in, in this mission, he actually he ends up meeting a, a starbase commander whose son is one of the kids that he knows from his uh, experience uh, back in Discovery Season 2 on the Klingon planet at Monastery Boreth when he sees his future that he saves this group of cadets and this kid is one of those cadets. So he's so he's ha- he's sitting around having these misgivings. He's going to write a letter to this kid, say you know don't join Starfleet. He's going to write a letter to all the kids. He's going to prevent it because he just he just can't live with it. And that's when you know uh, the Ghost of Christmas Future shows up and starts telling him, well, hey, I brought another crystal with me. I mean, it was the whole thing real? Was he dreaming? I don't know. I mean, it just seems kind of mm-hmm. unlikely where the dude came from. But yeah, he shows that up. Was with one a, weird thing in the episode yeah. for me. He was like, uh, but I mean, you know, it's Star Trek. It's going to be wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Well, he was sent from the Klingons from the from uh, the future. That was from the, the temple. Yeah. Oh, you see, from shit. that same temple because he says something about how you you oh you're sounding like the Klingons from that such and right. such temple. Right, that, right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, so, and he so goes, he, yeah. Who do you think sent me? Oh, uh, because he so he was physically there, but he was yeah, there with no, the box and yeah, okay, that. Okay. it was more the fact that he was like, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. That was weird for me. Right. So. Uh, all right. But anyway, we, this jumps us forward into the events of and Katie. I don't know if you because I said watch this episode. TOS oh, I did. Ep- yeah, TOS episode uh, Balance the Balance of Terror, of Terror which mm-hmm. I think is episode nine of season one or thereabouts. Yep. You'll if you find you'll look it. But anyway, yeah, yep. it's when we true. It's the true face to face first encounter with the Romulans after a hundred years of the Romulan War, which takes place after the Enterprise series. Um, when we finally figure out that the Romulans and the Vulcans share a common heritage, and it's it shows that Pike's approach, um, uh, as opposed to James Kirk's approach, for, you know, and that was a surprise for me because, you know, there was a photo that dropped a number of months ago. Oh, season two is going to have uh, actor Paul Wesley as James T. Kirk and then blammo, he's in this episode. You know, I the, knew he was going to be in it. Like they every, showed, <laughs> Everybody like knows everything but finale. me. I mean, I, was I knew. I to show me an episode before. Right. I knew from the clips that, you know, because we saw that uh, Uhura was on the ship again, but she was wearing a slightly different uniform. And, uh, you know, so th- there were little uniform tweaks even in this this time period, which was seven years f- uh, forward, uh, that illustrates that that time had passing. So it, it was it was a surprise, but not a surprise. It, the, Kirk in this time period commanding another ship. La'an is actually his XO. So we see her very briefly, too briefly. Um, and then we get a voiceover of, uh, and actually I looked it up, a video game actor who was voicing, doing Scotty's accent. So Scotty was also on the ship at that time. But we don't have we don't have Bones and we don't have Sulu on the ship. Um, but yeah, this, re- this whole thing really portrays, you know, by Pike handling things differently and not being as aggressive as Kirk. And then Kirk, whose ship gets destroyed, and then he's there in Pike's ear, like, you got to be more aggressive. Rah, 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 rah. You got to do this thing. You got to do that thing. Pike's like, hey, dude, fuck you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And by doing that, he precipitates a full-scale war with the Romulans. And that's why we see wartime Monster Maroon Pike back saying, uh, and also it's, you know, it deals a crippling blow to Spock, who is, you know, mm-hmm. uh, who is all but Put in the beeping wheelchair yeah exactly he does yeah. he does become beeping wheelchair exactly correct so i mean they were uh, brutal with the the scene of that too oh god like yes when and, they go around the corner and you see that yeah. like he's very clearly missing i was like Lost both leg, my spouse face, and i were like yeah. holy crap like yeah. i you know Lost, you expect yeah. to see yeah. that kind of like star trek's always been kind of campy with how they show violence and how they show brutality but if there's one thing like I feel like this season, you know, or this show right. has been a lot less um, reticent to kind of back right. off on that. They're like, no, we're going to show you the horrors of this stuff. Well, I mean, the, you know, in the modern era of storytelling in general, I mean, back in the 60s, for example, I don't think that kind of thing was really allowed. It became a little bit more, uh, you know, commonplace in, in the 80s and in the 90s. You remember there was a, a very late Peter, you'll remember this because you said you were watching TNG season one, the the conspiracy episode where they had those aliens that would crawl in, you know, someone's mouth and take over their body. When when they found the mother queen, they phasered him into 
until he exploded and they showed it on screen. And it was they got really so gruesome. So much trouble for that. <laughs> I think it's been banned on the BBC for like decades. I don't know if it, yeah, but yeah, that was really, that, so and that was in, be. that was in 1988. So that was, you know, really right at the beginning. So yeah, it was, I saw Spock. I was like, Oh my God. Yeah. But yeah, he's in the beeping chair. And so, but even Pike knows, um, through, you know, communicating with his time crystal, what future Spock holds even a hundred years in the future when he, you know, in TNG times, he's, he is responsible for leading the Romulans and the Vulcans down that reunification path, which mm-hmm. does finally happen because we see that in the tapes that Michael Burnham is watching in the 32nd century, that eventually Spock was successful in getting the Vulcans and the Romulans together. And they're living together on their plant, which is their on the Vulcan planet, which they rename. Help me out here. It's on the tip of my tongue. I don't Disco- look at me. Yeah, no, in Discovery, when they were living... Hold for me, I just call it Vulcan still. It, yes, it's, <laughs> it's, it's used to be Vulcan. Um, so, you know, as a send-off, and again, you know, we're seeing our people going our different ways. And then, you know, Una gets her comeuppance uh, for essentially what Dr. Bashir got away with uh, in the season six episode, Dr. Bashir, I presume, where his genetic tampering that his parents did on him when he was a kid... Um, was revealed. So she, you know, Pike's would-be girlfriend shows up and she's like, oh, this is super awkward, but I got to arrest her. And they take her away. And she's like, Chris, don't. I knew this was going to happen. I'm Mm -hmm. basically, she says I'm guilty and she's accepting her fate, but that's Mm -hmm. right where we're going to go when the show picks up again. And obviously I'm sure she's going to be exonerated. We're not going to lose her as a character, but I mean, and they let Bashir off the hook, right? So maybe they let Bashir off the hook because she goes through a trial and there's some precedent set with the Starfleet law that uh, what she did was okay. I don't know. I'm curious. Certainly, obviously, I'm certainly curious. Um, we'll see season two of Strange New Worlds. My gut tells me same time next year, so probably May of mm-hmm. 2023. Probably. The way that they roll through things. So, uh, any final thoughts on this episode in particular before we roll on to the big wrap up? Um, I I really enjoyed it. Um, honestly, I mean, and granted, like I watched this one first before I watched Balance of Terror. Mm-hmm. And I thought they did a really good job of kind of streamlining some of the bumps that were in Balance of Terror because right. they they introduced the idea of the outposts a lot earlier and that became more streamlined. I thought the conversations between Pike and the Romulan uh, captain made it a lot more um, interesting and a lot more impactful when he finally gives his like final speech of like you know this is duty and this is what I'm supposed to do and I think mm-hmm. in a future time we could have been friends. Where when he's saying it to Kirk, I'm like you. Like, you literally know nothing about this guy except for his command tactics, which is cool, but right. it's a little weird for you to be coming on being like, I think we could have been friends if we hadn't been trying to blow each other up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I get Star- where it was coming from. It's from a submarine movie. That's what it's based on. So it's a, it's a story of a story. So it's already copied over. So this is right. a story of a story of a story. This is like a really bad zero. But you can still write it in a way where it doesn't seem super choppy. I suppose. I mean, I would say that, like, I think that they did a better job writing that in um, the... The quality of mercy. Yeah, the quality of mercy yeah. versus in a balance of terror. That's what I'm mm. saying as far as that goes. Um, I can see that, too. I can see that, too. Yeah. For sure. Um, Peter, I, go ahead. Peter, go ahead. I thought that balance of terror worked a little bit better, in my opinion, but that's my opinion. Um Partially because with this one, I could tell when the dialogue was lifted from Balance of Terror because characters' diction changed, which was odd for me. Like, I could Ooh, tell when Spock was that. speaking as 1960 Spock, and okay. then all of a sudden he shifts to 2022 Spock. Um, the the really weird that. thing for me was how they shoehorned styles into ortegas because ortegas is very very different that that I, that i will 100 percent agree with you because it, and it was very uncharacteristic you took ortegas right she was all spot. Like she was yeah she's she like was normally just, spunky and happy and kind of yeah whatever. and then, she, and then, and then, then she's then, like super grumpy and and, and, like, and racist yeah racist towards spock yeah. um and, and the thing is like this, war yeah. hasn't happened yet so that's there's not really a reason for that to happen necessarily well you so, know and, and i know in styles in in the in the episode said well there were a lot of members of my family in the romulan war and that's why oh, yeah, you know, like from 100 what, years ago i'm still super pissed off it's like yeah okay there's definitely people like that i mean sure we got people like that yeah but it was country. just an we odd choice to make that, that yeah ridiculous. i mean that's yeah awesome. styles version of it was giving me a very like southern pride kind of yeah like feels of it and i mean i didn't think it was too out of place for 
um, Ortega because she does have a tendency to be aggressive. She has a tendency to be very, also true. you know, very bold and very blunt with her, with how she speaks. And so like when she was coming out, it felt like a much more grounded version of racism where it was done out of ignorance and out of fear versus out of, well, my ancestors died a hundred years ago. So I'm just going to call Spock those people. I mean, that's and- still ignorance and fear. Oh, yes. it is, but it's a much more characterized version of it where you don't, when you, you, when you're looking at it going, well, I don't speak like that, so I can't be racist. When you have someone like Ortega, who's still being racist, who's just doing it through microaggressions, so it doesn't seem as bad. So, it's, it's, it's not as in your face as right. style. So, yeah. So I was like, you know what? No, that, that kind of made sense for me for her character because she is very blunt in a lot of ways and very aggressive. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Let's do it quick and, and we'll roll we'll roll up on out of here. Season one, 10 episodes. Let's go with a favorite. Let's go with the least favorite. And then we'll uh we'll go with a hope for season two. So we'll go we'll go round robin per bit. Peter, favorite episode of the season. Um season uh episode six. Episode the, uh... six. I forget the name. Uh, lift us, uh, lift us up. My friend cannot reach. You oh. got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the one with the the one with the kid. And, yeah. Uh, and that society. I thought that was an exceptionally well done um, Trek style story with yeah. that conundrum and how they handled it. Um, yeah. I thought that was really well done. Gotcha. All right, Katie. Um, as far as my favorites go, that is that is a hard question. Um. I think the Elysian Kingdom might hold a good spot in my heart. Um, eight, even though I didn't love how they ended it with um, Mbinga's daughter, just yeah. watching the characters and the actors have so much fun with the changes in their personas was really, really enjoyable for me. Awesome, good deal. Um, I might actually have. I might go with the Serene Squall myself because Captain Angel put things on the map. My favorite Star Trek villain, I think we've seen since maybe Gold Dukat. You know what I mean? Somebody mm-hmm. who's re- somebody who's really delivering, <clears throat> and something that I think is 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 going to pay off in spades as the series goes on. That was definitely my second favorite. <laughs> I hear ya. All right, low point, Peter. I know you've had a few, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably all those who wander. Oh, okay. Um, I yeah, just, I didn't. Just as a package deal, I didn't like it. You, you didn't see it, how it, it just really stacked up. Well, stacked part up of it was list. because of Hammer. Part of it was because of um, the aliens, just too too many parallels. And the other yeah. thing, and also because they just monsterfied the Gorn in a way that I didn't think worked particularly. It didn't work for me. I mean, so. you know what? That's a fair way to say it. No, I totally understand. Katie, what was your dud for season one? I gotta say, episode six, lift us where suffering cannot reach. <laughs> oh my god, you guys are the perfect point and counterpoint. I'm like, I'm like, I'm the guy holding up the net in the game of Pong here. There it is. It just, I watched and I was like, oh, it's the trolley problem. Okay. It's just the trolley problem. And they didn't ever really give any specifics as far as like, how often do these kids have to, like, is this a once a week thing? Is this a once a year thing? Is this a once a generation thing? Like, how often are they having to kill these kids? God. And also there was the entire, like they never dove into a lot about that second colony besides like they were mm-hmm. offshoots of them, but right. they're, and they were trying to save the kid, but there was never any real closure. I felt where I thought they could have gone into that a little bit more. Um, oh yeah, I agree. Cause so. the rest of them were just like, fuck them kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was basically well, it the whole deal. Cool way it was a little bit more nuanced yeah yes. i mean yes. i did love the culture sure. built around sacrifice and i did think that that fit really well well into the themes of the season so i would say that that is a low point out of a lot of very high points that's like picking an episode where i rate all of them a seven or above so right i would I definitely agree. like i have already watched it again i still think it's a very engaging episode gotcha cool 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 all right i'm gonna go with um episode two children of the comet i get really tired of the space anomaly uh bit um and and that just kind of wore me out and again with uhura it was i don't know if i should be here and then she has it kind of reminded me of peter you'll appreciate this the second episode of 
Enterprise was the same thing with Hoshisato, even though it was a lot worse. She's like, I get space sick and I get burr, 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 and I don't want to be here. You know, Uhura wasn't quite that whiny, I guess is the best way to describe it. Yeah. But um, it was still like, you know, I went on this assignment and and I hummed a tune and it made the comet change its course or whatever. And now I think I belong here. I just, eh. that just that just didn't really, really do it for me. I don't know. Um, but again, I overall for the season, I don't know that I would say there was like I was like, oh, my God, I hate it so much. I'll never watch it again. But I, in my rewatch, I ran out of time because I wanted to watch the whole season. This was the one I stopped in the middle of it. And then when I started it again, it restarted again. And I'm like, I don't want to watch this one again. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what made me pick it. So. Um, all right. So hope for season two. One thing, one or two things that you're like, oh, I really want to see this happen. Peter. Um, I just hope we get more character dynamics, mm -hmm. um, like flesh out Ortegas a bit more, right? Um, get a good engineer, not another character that you're just gonna chuck. Right. Let's not do season one TNG where we have new engineer every week, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Well, and and um, I hope it's not Scotty because that would be a bummer. Oh yeah, you know. they already said that it won't be, but I, mm -hmm. I kind of hope that they don't. Um, right. Also, honestly, I don't want to <laughs> see that much of Kirk. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. We, we're, we're, I we're, love Kirk, James we're Kirk. Over the top, but you know? I don't really want them to. Well, and canonically, that. those two never met, correct? They're, Kirk, they're and, Kirk and Spock. There's, no, there's, Kirk, there's and, a lot, uh, Pike. Kirk and Pike. Kirk and Pike did not meet, no. Yeah, so yeah. I'm. If they're he going knew to, of him, but they didn't meet. Right. right. And so, like, I imagine if they're going to have him in, they're going to be doing parallels rather than. Right. At least, I mean, the, and I'm the hoping. The only thing yeah. that they could do is, like, trying to have him no spock but the canon with that is really screwy with did yeah. they know right. each other in the in the academy where did they meet right um i think that leaving them knowing each other at the academy so you don't have to do that would be better but right mm -hmm. true 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 all right katie big um, hope you need to bring my girl back una immediately immediately <laughs> mutiny, mutiny they took my girl una um i'm really ho more angel more gorn um and yeah, hopefully, I I enjoyed the version. I enjoyed the actor for Kirk. I thought they made him weirdly aggressive. Um, he was much more aggressive than yeah. Shatter. He was yeah. much more aggressive um, in balance or in this episode versus balance right. of terror. So the I'm recasting, right? Yeah, I'm wanting to see how they kind of play and develop him. Um, but yeah, I'm really just, and I hope that Lon comes back soon because I really, really enjoy her, and I right. want to see more of her. I hear you. I will go with something that I don't want to see that was actually pursuant to one of the news stories that we were going to talk about, but I thought this would be a better conversation. I don't want to see any Klingons. I am Klingoned out. Yes. Um, you know, Katie and I talked about our mutual disdain for the first season of Discovery because they kind of beat the Klingons into the ground. They did weird things with them that I didn't like. There were some and it very didn't just, weird choices. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't just the fact that they took their makeup and did it in just a really bizarro direction. It was just... Just let it go. They you know, changed let the culture a bit too much too, which was exactly weird. yeah. They did. They yeah, with the, the sleeper it, ship like, and the ship. It's one of the, the most like fleshed out cultures in Star right. Trek. So it's just weird. Yeah, throughout yeah. DS9 anyway. in particular, and then Belana Torres and Voyager, you know, and her struggles with. So yeah. So I'm gonna say I would love it to stay Klingon free, but I know it won't. So I <laughs> hope that it is minimalized. That's that's my big finger cross. So, okay. Season one of Strange New Worlds. That's a wrap. Katie, that's a wrap. We don't have a date for Lower Deck, so you're going to be, it's, it's going to be a bit until you're back, but I hope that you'll consider coming back in this format because we, this, this is great. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When uh, Lower Decks comes on, I will be here. Nice. Absolutely. I like that. Lower Decks. Lower, Lower Decks. Lower Decks. Lower Decks. Lower Decks. <laughs> All right. All right, listeners, you're going to hear me hit the pause button while Katie goes away, and then Peter and I are back for enterprise Arama. So, Katie, Katie, where do people find you? Um, you can find me on Twitter on QT Geek. That is Q underscore T Geek. And you can find me on um, Instagram when was, at Quintessential Geek. <laughs> All right, cool. We will see you soon, my friend. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Everyone asks... Corinthian leather. Of course, why not the best? It's the same with our new Chrysler New Yorker. It gives you everything. Powerful V6, anti-lock brakes, front-wheel drive, rich leather, 770 protection plan. And Chrysler's exclusive crystal key program, complete car coverage with owner care that's even better than Rolls-Royce or Mercedes. Chrysler New Yorker gives you the one thing you always wanted in a luxury car. 
everything. Back again. Uh, and we were going to keep our fingers crossed for when we get Lower Decks back because I'm, I'm fired up for it. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about a little program uh, that we've been talking about for a couple of episodes now. That would be Star Trek Enterprise. This is, yeah. this is segment three. Uh, so we're deep into 2002, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, early 2003. 2003. 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we are, um, yeah, we're getting into some, what I think is a much more decent crop of episodes. So, oh yeah, Peter, kick us off. So the first, the first episode we're doing, um, is Stigma, uh, directed by David Livingston, written by Rick Berman and Brandon Braga, aired February 5th, 2003. Sub Commander T'Pol learns that she has Panar Syndrome, contracted from her mind meld in a previous episode, Fusion and faces being ostracized by Vulcan society, particularly for medical needs. Exactly. Wow. Talk about on the nose. What's so weird is this episode of Fusion. I'm like, shit, did we talk about this already? No, like during one. this? Yeah, I really had to dig to find out, which is, you know, a statement, at least for me, that it's, you know, there are a lot of these episodes that just don't like, oh, man, that was the best episode of season blank. I just yeah. I just couldn't figure it out. But, yeah, in that episode, uh, she was, you know, she was mentally assaulted, you know, akin to to a, a, an assault of any kind, really. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, and then, yeah, so they're at this conference and, you know, uh, just in her regular med medical treatment, Flax has figured out that she's got something going on. Uh, and he's like, well, there's there's Vulcan doctors here. She's like, I can't talk about it because it'll be stigmatized and I'll be I'll be, you know, I'll lose my job or and or be in prison and whatever it is. Um, and just holy shit, what a commentary on what's going on. Not, not only obviously with the struggle uh, of all people with stigmatized conditions and we don't need to dig mm. too deep into it, but people with HIV AIDS, really the LGBT community at large. And which then is, certainly, with, which is what yeah. this episode was an allegory for pretty clearly. Absolutely. Very so. clearly, you know, and everything going on. So I thought this was an exceptional episode. Um, yeah. And again, yes, it was, it was her fight against ignorance. She was so reticent to even open her up herself up to it because she, clearly didn't think that there was any way that they were going to help her and she would rather suffer in silence and die rather than and then yeah archer is just champs says when you know, one of my officers one of my friends is is suffering is going to die because of your ignorance and your fear you know jerk ass vulcans who he clearly is not super crazy about anyway he hasn't um, been crazy about them since episode one. So. Well, you know, mo most humans aren't at this point. But um, yeah, God, this is definitely one of the high points of of what we've been talking about here. So I, yeah, I, abs I absolutely love it. It's a good episode. One thing that I do like about this episode is it doesn't, um, while it's very, very clear on what it believes is the right thing to do, which is, you know, treat people like people. They're human beings, or in this case, Vulcans are Vulcans, and they need to treat each other with equal dignity right. and, you know, take care of each other, even if you don't agree with what they're doing, right? right. But, like, one of the things I was reading, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, and, like, um, I think it was Brandon Braga came out and says, like, we're, the point of this episode is we're not trying to give people answers. We just want you to think. Right. Um, and that's something right. that I think Star Trek, it needs to do more and it needs right. to, and, and it's better when it does that. Like Strange New Worlds has been doing this better. Discovery has mostly been like a swing and a miss on that particular yeah. brand yeah. of yeah. writing. Right, right, right. Exactly. As, so as this, far is, as... this is just a good episode with that on a sensitive topic, especially at the time, and just right. you know, helping people think about it. So correct Amundo. So okay, moving on. Episode 15 of the season is Ceasefire. Uh we have uh writer. Are we writer, writer, director, director, director blah, blah, blah. hello, I can talk. Uh, David Strayton, seen his name before, but I don't think we see it since. Chris Black was the writer, never heard of that guy. February 12th of 03, uh, Captain Archer negotiates a ceasefire between the Andorians and the Vulcans. I love it. We also got uh, actress uh, Susie Plaxon back, who played uh, Kalar, who was Worf's, the, the mother of Worf's child, his first love. Mm -hmm. uh, she was also Lady Q, or, you know, ju just Q. Uh, and Dr. Solar. And, and Dr. Solar also in TNG, but Lady Q is in Voyager. So, yeah, so she's she's Star Trek royalty and just an awesome lady. Uh, love seeing her in anything. But oh, she's yeah. she plays a rather duplicitous uh, right hand to uh, Commander Shran, who is Jeffrey Combs returning uh, one of our, you know, he's he's Star Trek royalty. Um, and there was some talk of, you know, working him and people like, I really want to see him be Dr. Boyce in Strange New Worlds. And that didn't come to pass. Not that I don't. Which love is Dr. unfortunate because that would have yeah. been cool. <laughs> 
I, I totally agree. And who knows? There's nothing to say that he's not going to be back in some other role. Um, but anyway, yeah, I thought this was great. I love how the series is portrayed in this now season and a half, a little over season and a half, um, just how much the founding member worlds of the Federation really didn't get along at all. The, you know, the humans kind of were like, uh, kind of rolled their eyes at the Vulcan because the Vulcans treated the humans like crap. Um, the Vulcans and the Andorians had a cold war slash open war scenario. Uh, we haven't met the Tellarites yet, but the Tellarites are extremely obnoxious. Uh, we're going to get more of just that. Just like in the season <laughs> Just like they're in TOS, yes, exactly. But it's more fleshed out here, and then you know we find that it's a it's a common cause that really gets the ball rolling, uh, you know, to the Federation. And this is not a terrible example of that because yeah, you've got yeah. Um, you've got uh, uh, Saval, who's actor Matt something or other. I'm drawing a blank. I um, can't remember either right now. But anyway, yeah, he's an established character in the series who we still continue to see more of. Uh, but I think this is great. I think this really moves the ball forward again in understanding that process yeah. of how things got from in a very short period of time. Because again, Enterprise as a series, if we pretend that the last episode really happened is over the span of 10 years and yeah. four of those years, which we did not see in the series, were, the, were essentially the Romulan War. Um, so we basically, in the four seasons, the four years of the show, there's a lot of stuff that happens once the Enterprise starts to get out there you know what's you know earth starfleet starts to get out there and, and meet other species and how it's earth that gets all these warring species to start to figure out that they have common goals and gives birth to the federation in that episode that we won't name <laughs> so yeah great great no it was it was a good one it was uh it yeah, was definitely ceasefire good. is great i i basically like any of the episodes with the andorians in it yeah the andorians are really really well done in enterprise Totally. So. We got to get you. We got to get you some blue paint and some antennae, and maybe maybe your red shirt can be uh, can be an Andorian. Mm -hmm. I have to see what we can do. You got the hair. Your hair's a little longer. I think the Andorian. Yeah, it needs to be cut right now. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good deal. All right. Episode sixteen. This one's yours. Ah, oh, yeah. Future Tense, directed by James Whitmore Jr., written by Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong, aired February nineteenth, two thousand three. Enterprise finds a derelict ship. Which is um, bigger on the inside, only to be attacked by both Sulaban and Tholian ships. You know, and shame on me rewatching this. Maybe I was, I, I think I watched this one in a hotel room because usually when I travel for work, I have a travel Roku and I'll plug it into the back of the TV. And I'll often I find myself watching these episodes so that I can be caught up, you know, and ready, yeah. ready to do these recaps. I remember very, this one was, it was a, was really not very memorable to me. I don't remember much about the ship. I don't remember why the Sulaban. Well, there's not much to yeah. remember about the ship. Right. Well, <laughs> good. I'm, trash can. I'm, I'm glad it's not me. Um, because again, this is our first taste of the Tholians, who again, mm -hmm. it's kind of like the Romulans and the Ferengi and the Borg in the series that we see them, but they don't say their name. So we didn't really see them. It's kind of, yeah. it's the, it's the, this versus the, this, you know, or yeah, I can see, but I can't hear, yeah. which just, it just doesn't work. And obviously uh, you can see from a writer standpoint, how they're trying to incorporate more elements that are familiar to the fans. Yeah. But again, the fans are already watching the show. So I, I think you wanted, I, I think potentially the focus should have been more getting people who aren't fans to be interested in the show by great storytelling of other kinds. So where do you sit with the Suliban as a villain? Do you like them? Do you think they're dumb? The Suliban? I, I kind of sit with the Suliban as kind of, kind of being this like mediocre villain. Like they're yeah. not awful, but they're not great. Cause they, cause a lot of it has to tie into the temporal cold war. And so they're not really, right. they're, they're not really agents in their own. Right. Right. Um, and so they don't, they don't work as well for me. Like Silicon is an interesting character, but yeah. like, they they don't have a whole lot of threat like right the zindi way more interesting well i mean yeah threat, so. i mean well and yeah the way that they come on strong which we'll talk about how they get yeah. but like, all rolled out at the end of our next yeah. episode because but like this episode is hilarious because you have the the very very clear doctor who reference throughout yeah, the right. entire thing because like they step down and it's like it's round and the center console right. and everything it, like for me that was just really funny yeah a little um, on the nose yeah no i gotcha so i gotcha well cool all right well moving on we had uh, oh boy boy was this one forgettable uh canamar uh episode 17 uh directed by alan uh, croker uh written by john shiban 
don't know the name. February 26th of 03, mistaken as smugglers, uh, Archer and Tucker find themselves on a prison transport ship. Again, no stakes 101. You know they're not going to get killed. The, you know, it's uh, the only familiar species you see is a Nausicaan, which it's weird how Nausicaans in their first appearance, which was in, I think, season six of TNG and, and Picard's a tapestry, tapestry flashback, uh, that, that, that they they can be- they speak English at basically a pig Latin level. And in this, they're like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And nobody's wearing, UT, you know, UT is a universal translator. So they wouldn't necessarily understand him anyway. So it's weird. And it's not the first time that that we've seen the Nausicaans in the series because they, they showed up very early on. Um, and it had to do with Earth Cargo Authority and Lawrence Monson, who's a child actor, was the main character in that. You know the one I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, it's just super forgettable. I found it, uh, maybe I was paying better attention than I was at the last one, but I, I kind of found it to be kind of two forgotten episodes in a row, you know, because this just didn't yeah. really go anywhere. I didn't really feel like they were in any danger. You knew it was all going to work out. Uh, and then there wasn't going to be any from anything from this episode that was going to be a great character moment for either one of our characters or a lesson learned or something that would carry forward. So it's just like, eh, you know? Yeah. I, this episode wasn't really all that, like it had a few funny moments. It had some interesting yeah. stuff with the, like the leader. But other than that, it's like, here's Tucker sitting next to a really chatty dingus. Right. Like, Chatty like, Dingus. There you go. That could just, be a new name of the episode. What do you think? Yeah. Chatty Dingus. All right. Chatty Dingus wins. Yeah, um, like it, just, yeah. it just wasn't a good episode. Like it was interesting, you know, like, oh no, we arrested them on accident. It's like, well, you guys are stupid. Like it, yeah. it, it wasn't all that interesting. Right. It's not a terrible episode, but it's not great. Right. Oh my goodness. All right. What's next? All right. The Crossing. Um, in, uh, Directed by David Livingston, teleplay by Rick Berman and Brandon Braga. Uh, story also by Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, and Andre Boromanis, who actually wrote um, the. Uh, T- he was TNG staff writing. He, he staff. did that, and interestingly enough, Brandon Braga and Andre Boromanis were the ones who wrote an Orville episode recently, the Gently Falling Rain one with the. Crow. Well, I wouldn't know anything. I, I tell you, the Orville. I just I, I watched that show. Quick sidebar: its first couple of years when it was on Fox and enjoyed it, but mm-hmm. came back after a hiatus of. God, what has it been? Two and a half years, like three years, a year or two years. Yeah, you know. And I was just that, that first. It just it was like a fart in church for me. I was just April when I looked at each other. I said, well, I don't even think we need to watch the second part of the two episodes that came out. So oh, are you? Yeah, are you? I liked it. Because are you keeping I, up with it? Oh, maybe I'll go back. Yeah, I, I liked it because at least with the first one, I, I know this is a complete sidebar, but like the first episode felt like a TNG episode touching on like a very sensitive topic. So like, okay. and they then they mostly dealt with it in a mostly okay way um, <laughs> mostly most do a couple of mostly's make an okay i don't know is that like three rights make a left i yeah, have I no suppose. idea like it's not that bad like all i right. thought it was pretty well done but that's oh my god all right there. back to track keep talking yeah about so this anyway um in- incorporeal aliens attempt to take over enterprise very short description that's really all that happens um they basically enterprise gets like sucked into this big ship and then these right. incorporeal aliens just start like exchanging consciousness with folks to try to like experience corporeal Stuff. existence right and it gets a little wonky um yeah. cuz like you have points where like people don't know and then they're being replaced and it was like right like it it's not bad but it was just one for me this was one of those episodes like Eh, okay whatever yeah you you did it you did a thing thanks for doing that thing it was great um yeah it was you know versus you know there was a tng episode in season five i think power play where they found a a world of malevolent little glowy dots that yeah took over troy o'brien and data and tried to take over the enterprise and what they really wanted to do was free the, the other glowy dots on the planet because the other glowy dots on the planet yeah, was a prison planet yeah. you know where this this was not that but you know, yeah, I mean, this was, was nice. It, yeah. it didn't it wasn't like, oh no, it's the malicious guys taking over the the, the bodies again. So it was like, right, that was nice. It was a slightly different twist, but <laughs> right. But again, you know what? I, and again, I watched the episode, but in some ways, I was like, oh god, this is boring. I kind of tuned out, and I was doing something else. But what were the you know what was the end game for the non corporeal beings? What do they really want to do? Did they just they all wanted to take over all eighty three bodies and be like, now we're going to take off into the galaxy on this old this 
technologically inferior ship and go that be a part of their to be world. Kind of what their goal was was just to like right. take it over and then so that they had basically it was like so they could have a corporeal playground. That's what it, right. That's what it felt like. It's like we want to be able to have physical existence. And just go out and see shit and test things right. out, and then that's it. And, and then we'll just yeah, like exactly. Team it. It's like so. It's like even for the um, protagonist of the story, they didn't really have. There were no stakes for them, and there was no goal for them. They weren't even really trying to do anything, uh, yeah. which is obnoxious. Which is kind of so. I just uh, kind of yeah. throw it out. So anyway, yeah. uh, moving on to what I think was a great episode of the season. Uh, episode nineteen is Judgment, uh, directed by James L. Conway, a stalwart of the franchise. Tale played by David A. Goodman. Don't Another. know the name. He's been in a bunch of. He's done a bunch of villains. So. Okay. Oh, he he's done a bunch of Enterprise, or he's just, um, just other like Enterprise and a bunch of other things. Uh, so. Oh, he said the name just does not jump out at me. Uh, from April of two thousand and three, Captain Archer. Oh, excuse me. He continues on the next page. Story by Taylor uh, Ed Elmore and David A. Goodman. Okay. Well, I don't know who Ta- Taylor Elmore is either. Sorry, guys. Uh, Captain Archer is arrested in prison by Klingons for apparently uh, allegedly conspiring against the Empire. Great episode, uh, yep. and it was told. It was told kind of in that fashion that took me back to the. Um, remember the the Voyager episode? Li- I think it was from season four, "Living Witness," where there was yep. this there was this uh, society seven eight hundred years in the future. They discovered some uh, d- uh, some stolen artifacts from Voyager who had visited their planet all that time ago, and they reconstructed this history where Voyager was a warship and everybody was ruthless, and they you know they killed Quite the prime minister. Episode, yeah, yeah, there was that. I remember really loving that episode at the time. Time, but this was, you know, completely unbelievable. Uh, it, it, beca- or it was, it was, it, it was very much a slant. It was kind of the Fox News of the, the Klingon Empire. You know what I mean? Like, oh, these guys came along and they disgraced us and they did this thing and that thing. I mean, it was uh, Duras. What do you expect? Yeah, it, it, exactly. So, and your main villain was Duras. So he was a. Uh, do you notice he was Duras, son of Taral? When our Duras in our time had an illegitimate child that he named Duras. I think Tural, Tural yeah. with the T, not a D. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I caught that when I was watching it. I'm sure I caught it back then as well. But yeah, you get a very skewed uh, story of how uh, there were some escaping uh, colonists, and obviously, the, you know, the Klingons' mo, and we saw it even earlier in the season, was they go about from place to place. Uh, they they come up to places and say, yeah, you know, we're going to help you out with supplies and stuff, but you're going to pay us tribute to our empire, and you'll be part of our empire. We'll protect you, blah blah. And they take what they want, and they just they break out. And they, you know, in, in which case they did with this colony of random aliens that they came along. They took a bunch of shit. These people were starving. They managed to get uh, get along in space enough to find Enterprise, and so Enterprise was providing them aid. And that's when the Klingons come back. Yeah. Um. And Archer stood up against them, and uh, and he got snagged. And so he, yeah, he's put through the Klingon kangaroo court almost bit for bit. What we see uh, in Star Trek Six, the Undiscovered Country, that Kirk and McCoy go through, uh, and that, that you know that was. 10 or so years before this, but they managed to recreate the sets pretty faithfully. I think it was much uh, smaller. The, it was definitely not the high court, but yeah, right. It wasn't the, the, well, the, it wasn't really a high crime. Uh, no, cause the, the like high crime. Yeah. This was like appellate court, Klingon appellate yeah. court. There you yeah, go. Yeah, it was. Ooh, that, that could be a Klingon circuit court. I think that's a more fun name for this episode. Yeah. Klingon there you circuit go. court. Give me a second. Clint. Um, so anyway, so what did you think? I quite like this episode. Um, I like the back and forth where they're telling different versions of the story. I mm-hmm. always like seeing JG Hertzler back as a Klingon. Doesn't matter ah, what yes. he's playing. No doubt. Uh, and, um, and and also for me, I like those little consistency things where like the the ball hammer thing. Like I like seeing Klingon yeah. culture bonk, just kind of bonk. there's there's some things that are gonna evolve, but there's some things that are sticking the same because it's just yeah. an older thing. Um, right. And so I like that and I liked how like Flox came down and was like telling him all this stuff about, you know, what the ship is doing because it's a doctor's visit. <laughs> like, right, exactly. Yeah. And, so, uh, and then, how he has to eat the gnarly, you know, clean on like, foot. Yeah. Yeah. Here, yeah. Targ foot, which has got bugs on it. Shit, and he's like, well, you know, I got, got to do what I got to do. It's got protein, um, Captain. Yes. Thanks, yes. <laughs> yeah, really. Mm, crunchy. Um, but I look at, yeah, and at the end of it, he ends up on Rorapente. And then they both end up in yeah. Rorapente. Yeah, I love just, it. And then, of course, you know, and we had the we had budget Rorapente, which was like a piece of an ice cave. And, you know, obviously there's only so much they could do on a TV budget. I'm glad they didn't like, let's reuse footage and make it, you know, look like Kirk was Archer or whatever. And so, you know, they put their own spin on it in the end. Archer obviously gets rescued. Um, 
but uh, yeah, J.G. Hertzler uh, had uh, fought the judge's ruling, who was like, well, we're not going to kill you, but we're going to imprison you forever. Um, so good luck. Uh, and yeah. then JG was like, bar, 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 bar. and he's like, that's, that's, that amounts to the same thing. Yeah. And then they say, and they send JG off as well and, uh, for a year's time. And then usually the, an estimate of a, a life expectancy of a prisoner on Rura Pente is about a year. So we don't really, we, we don't really think anything good happened to JG. So, oh, well, sorry. Um, but good for you for standing up for what you believe in. Yes. Big thumbs up there are you. honorable Klingons. They're not all just Duras. Yes, and yes. And this guy died, but he died. So, yeah, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> All right. So, episode 20, uh, ending our run. Peter, go ahead. Episode 20, Horizon, uh, directed by James A. Countner, written by Andre Bormanis, aired April 16, 2003. After the death of his father, poor Ensign Travis Mayweather visits his family on their cargo ship and begins to reconsider his place aboard Enterprise. Aww. Travis. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, I, I, yeah, this was, you know, one of the four episodes where he got characterization, the poor guy. I mean, he, um, I like the earth cargo service stuff. Um, cause yeah. it really gives you a vibe between, you know, now and essentially 130 ish years from now, which is where enterprise is supposed to take place after we unfortunately have world war three. Sorry, that's going to be a bummer, but it's coming. Uh, or at least it was for them. Hopefully it's not coming for us. Um, kind of what it was really like when mankind reached out to the stars. You know, and they, because um, obviously after they met the Vulcans, then they started to have ships where they could travel off the planet. And so they needed, you know, supply lines. And that's where the Earth Cargo Service was born. Um, and Travis is, you know, the, the thing that's really central to his character is that he's a space boomer, born in space, lived in space his whole life, and never set for, foot on Earth until he went to Starfleet Academy. Um, and, but yeah, within this, I mean, his his dad had passed away, but he missed a message that it was six weeks ago, but Enterprise was passing by and he had the occasion to, to pop in. And his uh, his brother, I couldn't remember if it was his older brother or his younger brother, who is the character. His older brother. This is older brother, who's, you know, kind of a grump. And like, you know, Peter, do you have a brother? I have a brother. I have four. You have four. Jeez, Mary. Um, you know, brothers can be kind of, because uh, they're men and men fight, men, you know, men are a pain in the ass in general. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a little bit be. of, a, <laughs> yeah, it can be. It's a, you know, it's a little bit of a, you know, my little brother ran off to Starfleet and you should have been here because, because really you could clearly tell that their father kind of preferred Travis. And while he was bummed off, bu- bummed out that his son left, he knew that his son had to follow his dream. And, and this was circling back. So he comes back, he sees some of his old friends on the ship. Um, you know, he has a, he has a platonic female friend because Travis, Travis is never going to have a romance. He's, he's Jordy. He's Jordy, though they do throw him a bone at the end of the series with that reporter chick. And that is, that's a weird thing we'll talk about on down the road, but, um, you get kind of a standard story where there's, oh, there's pirates that are trying to steal their stuff and Travis wants to help, but you know, the brother wants to want, you know, wants to swing his rod and be the big shot and uh you know in the end of it travis is able to help them out and and there's there ends up being you know a little bit of understanding between the brothers and stuff so i i liked it you know i i like family yeah. I, I like when you know when star trek jumps in with a little bit of the family strife and you know not everybody's perfect you know Riker and his dad troy and troy and her mom you know yeah. um just you know uh Family drama because we all deal with it, right? So it, it right. makes it that that much more. Worf and his parents. Worf and his parents. Worf and his brother. Worf and all Klingons. Yeah. Do you, you know think what I mean? That, like you know, I think the Bashirs were like perhaps the one example of a family that didn't have like super major problems. Like they right. had like the problem, you know, lying to Starfleet and all of that. Right. But, like the like they didn't have like quote unquote familial dysfunction in a major way. Um, I mean, they they didn't speak to each other. Well, Bashir wouldn't speak to his parents because well, yeah, they, you know... I'm misremembering the episode then. So yeah, I, yeah. I for me, it would be nice if there was one family dynamic that wasn't right. weird because right. it, it's to the to for me, it's to the point of like like with some of like the discovery episodes, I still ask the same question with some of the plot points that they do. Like, right. who hurt you? Like, right? Like, Why are you so, there's, yeah. Like, Why are there's, you so like wrong especially like there's a lot of stuff in like modern media in general where it's like families are broken like that's one right. thing that i appreciate about ms marvel is it's not that way 
Like, right. Very true. Yeah. It's, I mean, there there are Discord, but they're 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 together. There's like, and, and, there's like they fight and, and, because families they, fight. Right. But, right. But in, but but in the end of it, they're pulling together. You know. Yeah. To, they to still love each, each other, other. and they'll, and they'll stick yeah. each other stick with each other. And you see that right. in Horizon in the end. Right. But they're like relearning that. Right, so, right. Which is, you know what? That's a journey that a lot of people go through. Yeah, you know, like there's nothing their lives I'm just families. I would yeah. appreciate to see a little bit more of, you know, yeah. just like, hey, let's have someone go home and their family's like, nice. Right. Not like Picard going home and, why did you come here, you dumbass? Oh, <laughs> God, yeah. That, yeah, that's the best example. His brother was the doctor in 20 years and they get in a fist fight, you know, and yeah. uh, or Riker and his dad or Riker meets his transporter clone and they can't get along. And there's a great... Uh, <laughs> My favorite exchange in that episode is you have, and they did a lot of this later in TNG, but Worf and Data are talking and Data observes the Will and Tom Riker not getting along. And he's like, Lieutenant, if you met a duplicate of yourself, would you find him hard to get along with? I think so. Why? I am not easy to get along with. And Data goes, hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was it's like, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Total sidebar. Humor is great. <laughs> yeah, very, and I, and I love the relationship with those two. But anyway, okay, so that wraps up um, this segment, segment three. Um, how do you think we fared versus the previous segment? I think it was a slam dunk, head and shoulders. Yeah, Maybe we had, what, we had we had like, like two like, two duds, and the rest were stars. I thought, or they were. And they weren't even anyway. like duds. They're just kind of like, yeah, yeah. So. It's like eh, it's it's not bad, but it's nothing. So yeah, it wasn't um, like sitting there going. Oh, please don't make me watch this again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, boo, boo. Um, yeah, headed into the next episode. Um, we don't have a new program to talk about, so it's just going to be you and me. Um, yeah. So it could be it could could be a shorter episode, but I think we'll work some new. Maybe we'll hear some... more about Resurgence, the video game, and we can talk about that. I don't know. Yes, we'll yes. Hopefully we'll get some news going. So anyway, thanks for sitting in. Peter, go ahead and take us out, please. All right. For more information about Starfleet International, please visit Grand Petoskey on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Twitter friends, thanks for joining us. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the C3. Uh, April and I obviously, uh, my wife April and I obviously run the USS Grand Petoskey fan club here in West Michigan, of which Peter is one of our senior officers. Peter, where do people find you on social media? All right, you can find me at Petrus Aquinas on most social media platforms. Oh, yeah, I don't post good much stuff from there. <laughs> I know. I'm, I keep tagging you more, so maybe you'll do more. We'll see what happens. All right, friends. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to tell you, as always, that sharing is caring and to keep on trekking. Peace and long life. This podcast is part of the Secret Friends Unite podcasting network. Visit secretfriendsunite.com for more great shows, articles, news, reviews, and more. Secret Friends Unite podcasts are available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and other podcast services around the world. If you'd like to be part of the conversation, you can join us on Facebook or our new Discord server, or follow at Secret Friends U on Twitter. Please subscribe to Secret Friends Unite on YouTube and visit our merch store at tpublic.com. Just search Secret Friends Unite. Thanks for listening.